All right, so we are currently in Acts part two. If you haven't been at Grace for a while, um, earlier in the year, we did Acts part one. And it's just the funniest thing ever to be like, where are we at? Like, what, what's your church getting into? And we're like, oh, Acts part two, uh, chapter nine, week three. You know what I mean? It's just like, there's a bunch of different titles for each week. And so today is Acts part two, week two, chapter 10. Okay. For those of you who are wondering where we're at exactly, uh, that's for you. So last week, Josh kicked off part two of Acts, uh, but jumping into chapter nine, and he talked about the conversion of Saul. Wasn't that an amazing sermon last week? Just an amazing conversation. Uh, just the message, right, of the availability of the love and the grace and the calling that God has for all of us, no matter who we are, what we've done, where we've been, what we haven't done, right, all that stuff. And so this week, we're going to jump into the next chapter, like I said, chapter 10, and follow our story. So I actually would love if you pull your Bible out. Uh, we're going to jump right into the Word. Again, chapter 10 of Acts, and we're going to start in verse 1. It's going to be on the screens if you don't have that with you. So let's follow along here. So it says, In Caesarea there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius. He was captain of the Italian reg regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. He gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. One afternoon, about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming toward him. Cornelius, the angel said. Cornelius stared at him in terror, as people do when an angel appears, right? What is it, sir? He asked the angel. That was way more hopeful. It's probably like, what is it? You know? And the angel replied, your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now send some men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying with Simon, a tanner who lives near the seashore. So let's break this down. First thing we need to recognize is they did not know how to come up with new names, okay, back in the day. How many Simons? They weren't, Simon? It's like the Spider-Man, you know, Simon? Simon, it's just like everybody was named Simon at some point. So immediately, right, we get this, and that's just a joke, but uh, we get to see a man named Cornelius. And uh, it's a shift first, actually. We're talking about uh, Peter today. And last week in chapter nine, Luke had us with, with Saul and Paul. And now we're going to Peter, again, the rock that God wants to build. Jesus said he would build his church upon. Uh, and so we're gonna talk about Peter and how he's moving the gospel of Jesus. But it starts with a man named Cornelius. Who is Cornelius? First thing we see is he's a Roman officer, right? Uh, a centurion, a man of authority is what this means. This guy is probably over in the Roman army, about a hundred different guys, a hundred different soldiers. He's in charge of them. He's the kind of guy who says, do this. They do it. He says, go there. They go there. This man has authority. He's living in Caesarea, uh, which is also the location of the, uh, the headquarters of the Roman administration at the time, a nice coastal place. Um, he's not living deep into the mountains closer to Jerusalem or anything like that, where maybe the weather's not as nice. Like the dude's received some favor, right? So he's got some favor. Favor. He's got some authority. When people say the name Cornelius, I bet some dudes go, oh, Cornelius. You know what I'm saying? So a Roman officer, uh, but also the scripture says he was a God-fearing man. This is interesting, right? A God-fearing man. What do they mean by that? So he talked to God, says he prayed, right? And, and actually there was a moment where he was praying uh, in, uh, at 3 p.m. is what it says. And it's believed that 3 p.m. was one of the times that the Jewish people would enter into prayer. So he's talking to God. Not only is he doing that, but he's kind of following the Jewish cultural ways and, and their religious ways of when and how they would spend time with the Lord. Um, it's believed he probably attended Jewish synagogue. Um, he was kind to the Jews, generous, constantly giving uh, alms to the poor, right? Was it, it doesn't say that he was somebody who uses authority to create some kind of, you know, difference or use power over the Jewish people. No, 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 like we've seen and heard before, he was kind to them. He kept moral laws. He gave up the original cultures, his old ways of worshiping other gods, of, of pagan gods, and he followed the Jewish ways. So as a whole, it's interesting and it's safe to say that Cornelius was unlike majority of the Roman centurions and Roman officers, right? This guy was a Roman who was also a God-fearing man. Usually those two don't go together when you read stories in scripture, right? When you read passages about who these Romans were, or what they did, it just is kind of different. It stands out and it makes you think, if you remember, Jesus's interaction with another Roman officer and the need for a healing of his servant. Do you remember that? And, and, and Jesus says that this man had faith unlike anything he had seen in the land, right? So another, another picture of that with this guy. So we've got a couple who act like this. So Cornelius is hanging out, following the Jewish ways, and he gets a visit, an angel appears to him, right? And uh, his response when the angel appears is, what is it, sir? And I think this is super interesting because uh, the tr other translations of scripture will say, he says, what is it, Lord? And the translation of the word Lord there is not necessarily Yahweh or God um, or God the Father, but specifically just a sign of respect, like Lord, sir, whoever you are, I recognize you as real authority. 
that I'm going to show respect and sit in reverence and in awe of who you are and respond that way, All right? So just cool coming from a guy who's got that authority himself. So an angel appears and lets him know that God has seen how he treats the Jewish people. God has recognized it. He treats them with real care and kindness. And not only that, God has heard and received Cornelius' prayers to him, and he counts them as authentic. He says he received them as an offering. They were real and true from his heart to God. So the angel tells Cornelius to do something. He gives them a command. He says, send men to find a man named Simon Peter, who is in Joppa, and bring him back to you. So Cornelius, no questions asked. He's like, go do it, right? He receives the command. He uses his authority to send out a command, and it happens. So he does as he's commanded, uh, and then the scene now switches back to Peter. Like I said, we're going to spend some time talking about Peter today. So at this time, Peter is in Joppa, uh, and uh, Joppa is a, uh, another coastal place about 30 miles away, 30 miles down the coast from Caesarea. So just an interesting setup again that God has Peter this close where uh, they could, these men that, that Cornelius sent out could really just travel about a day's time to get to Peter. So a close trip for them. We're talking about a close trip. Yeah, imagine walking a day, right? Um, but he sends them and they go and they find Peter in Joppa. And uh, at the time, uh, God had Peter in Joppa because uh, previously in another town very close to Joppa, Peter had healed somebody and then he had come to Joppa and he, God used him to Res, uh, resurrect a woman from the dead, right? There was a lady, her name was Tabitha. Translation of her name is Dorcas. Thanks a lot, mom and dad. You know what I'm saying? Like, just the choice. They didn't have to make that choice, but they did. And so Peter brings Dorcas back to life. God through Peter brings Dorcas back to life. And so after that, he's hanging out in Joppa. God has him there living with the other Simon, the tanner. And uh, Peter one day is getting ready to go into prayer with God. And he's hungry. He says he's so hungry. And he goes up and he starts spending time in prayer with God. And he's so hungry, he falls into a trance. Falls into a trance on the top of this roof. Uh, on this building. And uh, what happens in this vision he has in this moment is the heavens, scripture says the heavens open up. And as the heavens open up, a large sheet held at the four corners begins to descend in front of Peter. Right? Can you imagine that? You're like, what? And it comes down and on the sheet are a bunch of animals, a bunch of animals, all kinds of different animals falling before him. And this is what it says uh, in Acts chapter 10, verse 13. Then a voice said to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat them, All right? So some food, you're very hungry, and the Lord literally provides some food for you and says, eat. And how does Peter respond? No, Lord, Peter declared, classic Peter. You know what I mean? Like, no, Lord, always, you know what I mean? Stay awake, no, you know, just all kinds of stuff. No, Lord, Peter declared, I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. So if you don't know the background here, this can be a little bit confusing. Uh, what Peter, the reason Peter responds the way that he does is because original Jewish law stated that there were animals. If you look back to Leviticus 11, there were animals that God said were unclean. They were not for the Jewish people to eat, right? They were not pure and they would create the gap. They would add to the distance between them and God. They would take away from the cleanliness for them to be in right standing with God. So God said, do not eat these kinds of animals. And you can go through that whole chapter and it just lists it out, right? Um, in depth. And so he lists, lists those off. And so Peter's thinking back to that. He's like, no, 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 we're not allowed to eat these, God. You've told us, you've commanded us, don't eat these unclean animals. And these are the kind of animals that have come down on this sheet. So again, we, we read that and we, we see Peter's response and it might be kind of hard to understand what's going on. Because if it's me and a sheet of bacon falls down from heaven... Right? There will, there, no words will be had, you know? Just some praise and some eating. That's it. So verse 15, the passage goes on, but the voice spoke again. So Peter says no, and the voice speaks again. Again, it says the voice spoke again. It says, do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. Amen. The same vision was repeated three times. Then the sheet was suddenly pulled up to heaven. Peter was very perplexed, as we all would be, right? What could the vision mean? Just then the men sent by Cornelius found Simon's house standing outside the gate. They asked if a man named Simon Peter was staying there. Meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling over the vision, the Holy Spirit said to him, three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry for I've sent them. So let's, let's keep walking through this. So first off, I just think it's interesting too. Uh, 
first section we read, and then this part again in verse 15, it says the voice, a voice from heaven, the voice spoke. It doesn't clarify exactly who the voice is, and I'm not going to tell you that I know exactly who it is. I think it is interesting. Uh, certain translations in those moments when the voice speaks are in red, and so it could imply that that's Jesus speaking. Uh, it makes sense for that. Uh, and then also just the idea, um, just kind of fun, uh, that uh, it's repeated. The vision is repeated to Peter three times. You remember Peter on the, three, on the, sh- the seashore, right, with, with Jesus after his resurrection, and it's like, do you love me? three times, right? Go and feed my people. Go and lead my sheep three times. And it's just like, could be Jesus being like, it's me. You know what I mean? Uh, so the voice speaks, and I do, but I do love the clarity at the end because there may be some questions there, but then at the end, the Holy Spirit's like, here you go. Luke makes sure that we know that Peter knew the Holy Spirit is talking to him and tells him, hey, I've sent these men here. You need to go with them. Don't really ask questions. Just go. Trust that I'm with you and that I'm, I've got a plan here, right? And so Peter's like, all right, I'm going to go with them. But a lot of questions, what did the vision really mean? What was the point of the animals on the sheet? What did the voice mean by God making things clean and Peter calling those things unclean, kind of going back and forth? Uh, there's, there's some questions here that, that we want to see answered, right? And so moving on, Peter does go. He obeys the command of the Holy Spirit. They arrive in Caesarea about a, l- a little over a day later, and he goes to see Cornelius um, as the men had asked him to do. And so when he, he gets there, Cornelius shares his story of what happened to him with the angel previously. Um, And uh, here's how Peter responds to the story that Cornelius tells him. Verse 34, then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. This is the message of of good news for the people of Israel, that there is a peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. So what's going on here? He gets there and, and Peter kind of has this moment where things click, okay? He, he begins to recognize God is moving. God is doing something. The Holy Spirit's showing up. He's telling me to go here. I've had this vision. He had a visit from an angel. There's a lot of different stuff here, but God is moving. And so what direction is the, is, is, is the question, is it that God is moving? And what I think Peter's beginning to see, he talks about people and God showing no favoritism, right? In every nation, he says, he accepts those who fear him. You see, just to, just to give you some, some background a little bit is there's a lot of kind of hostility between uh, the Jews and who Peter is with now amongst Cornelius, the Gentiles, right? Two different groups of people. And if you know about the Jews uh, and the Jewish people, God's Israel, they were chosen and set apart by God in the very beginning, right? Through God's promise and his, his covenant with them, they were gonna be used by God to move forward his plan. He was gonna use them in mighty ways to bring about his kingdom and his glory and all of that from the very beginning, right? The Gentiles were not people who were involved with this religion, with, with God at all, completely outside of God's set apart people, And this is a big deal because Peter has just gone into a Gentile home, right? He's sitting amongst Gentiles. If you look at the law, this is illegal for Peter to do. This is wrong, right? This is against the plan that God had laid out. These are against the laws that God had laid out for his people originally. And so him taking a step in there is a huge, huge deal. He even lets him know, we'll, we'll look at this in a little bit in chapter 11. um, He, he, he voices, or sorry, here in chapter 10, that it's wrong for him. He's like, I'm not supposed to cross this boundary that's been set for me to come in and spend time with a Gentile, to sit and eat and to talk. Um, It's wrong for me to even be in your house because you are a Gentile and I'm a Jew. So there are a lot of restrictions that God has placed, right? And, and we can get into the reasons why God places them. Um, and, and the truth is, is we, we can see some of them. God had a plan and he's protecting that plan. He's protecting his people. He's providing for them. He's doing whatever it is that needs to be done so that they can be in right standing with him. All kinds of different reasons. And truthfully, some that we just don't know the answer to because God is God and he is sovereign and has a way and a will that we can't completely see, right? And understand. Um, but he's moving and he's brought the Jews into this. And so being set apart, It's a beautiful thing. It's a gift and an honor from God, right? To be used by him in a mighty way here on this earth. And that's a cool thing that the Jews are given. However, being human beings, they make things weird, right? How many of y'all know that human beings make things weird? We just do, man. It's just a real thing, right? And so the original goal for Israel is to be honored and gifted by God and to be used by him for his purpose and plan, not just for them, but for the world, ultimately to let God's light shine, right? The misconceptions, though, that the Jewish people gain over time and as they walk in their humanity and in their flesh and in their sin is that they think of being set apart as something of I am better than. They lose sight of God's heart behind his actual calling for them, right? Being set apart to them when they're in the midst of that and then of themselves and of their flesh is 
I'm set apart, I'm more worthy. Maybe I'm set apart, I'm more important, I'm more loved by God. I'm set apart, I'm probably more right than you are always, right? I'm set apart, I'm just different. And because you're not like me, this could never ever be, right? And I have to treat you differently. I have to treat you with sometimes hate, to treat you like almost like you're nothing sometimes. Was this the heart of the Father for those people? No. Did God want to protect his people again? Lots of reasons. Was he doing something? And did he have these boundaries for purposes? Absolutely. But what we see later on, right, is that this wasn't his overall plan. Jesus reveals the true heart and plan of the Father in the end. But here, there's struggle. I wouldn't say that there's a, there's a part of this where there's this prejudice that lies between these two groups of people. When, in chapter 11, when, when, when Peter returns back to the apostles and he explains to them all that happened in chapter 10, right, all that he walked through with Cornelius, um, he's immediately criticized for going into the Gentiles' home, right, and eating with them. Like I said, you're not supposed to do that. It's against the laws. And those are, those are unclean people. Don't do that. Don't do that. Who does that remind us of? Jesus, who constantly sat at the table of sinners and broken men and women, made friendship and relationship with them got close to them, called them by name, broke bread with them. Jesus, right? And so Peter's moving forward in this way that Jesus has trust in God, even though he knows of these rules and these authorities, he, God brings recognition to him of, okay, I see that God shows no favoritism, right? So this, this, this contempt and this weirdness between the Jews and the Gentiles, right? Maybe God's come to repair. And so what Peter is doing in this moment, what God is calling Peter to do, what he's bringing him to ultimately is to bring the good news of Jesus to the Gentile people to let them know that this is not something that only the Jews who were set apart in the beginning can now have. This is for the world. The good news of Jesus is for every single person in all time. And God is gonna use Peter to bring that about. And Peter is seeing that now, right? And I love too, just, just a little side thing is Cornelius has become the poster child of this, right? Again, Roman officer, a guy who's probably had his own ways back in the day. He doesn't fully understand how this all works, but he's starting to feel this, this draw, right? And I think it's within, within all of us, really, as human beings, this draw to the Father and to his ways. There's things that are built into us that were placed there by him, and so we're naturally drawn in his direction. And Cornelius is leaning into that. He's giving up his own ways, his old ways, and he's, he, God's using him to remind us, like, like we talked about last week with Saul, that, hey, it doesn't matter who you are. You can join my family. Doesn't matter what you've done, you can be a part of my family. Any nation, any people, any time, you can be a part of the family of God. He is swinging the doors wide open and he's starting it with, P with Peter and Cornelius. And maybe you're like, oh, wait, wait, I thought Cornelius was already a God-fearing man. Like, I thought he already had this whole thing down. What do you mean? Like, why, why was Peter coming and presenting the good news of Jesus? So this is what Paul says in Romans 2, verses 14 and 15. It says, even Gentiles who do not have God's written law show that they know his law when they, when they instinctively obey it, even without having heard it. Again, those natural things that God has placed in us in creation that we're drawn to, they demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts for their own, conscious, for their own conscience and thoughts, either accuse them or tell them they're doing right. So he had this within him like we all do, but Cornelius needed Jesus. God had changed the way in which he made his people or gave his people an opportunity to be in right standing with him. And the only way now for that to happen was through relationship and salvation in Jesus Christ. Cornelius was a God-fearing man. He understood and gave reverence and awe to God, right? You know, we know those people are like, I believe in God. I believe he's in control. He's, he's all powerful. Like there's no way it would have worked without him, but there's no relationship with Jesus. There's no real walking out with the Savior on a daily basis. Do you know those people, right? The, praise God for those people. We love those people, Right? Cornelius is somebody in that spot. If he, he understands there's something more, but he needs to know that the way, the truth, and the life is Jesus Christ. And he needs to hear the good news about him so that he too can be invited and brought into the family of God. And the same for the rest of the Gentiles. They need to hear the good news and know that no matter who they are, where they've been, they can be brought in. And so Peter had to overstep this prejudice, this built up idea of chosen and not chosen, welcome and not welcome part of God's plan and not part of God's plan. He saw God moving and followed the move of God. So here's what this has to do with us. Cause all right, that's cool. Cool history, cool walkthrough. What does this have to do with me today? The Jewish people switched up the roles on who actually was in the seat of authority and judgment. 
when it came to their relationship with God and how they approached those and said who was worthy and who was unworthy. And the reality is that sometimes we do that too. We switch up the roles of who is to decide who is worthy and who is unworthy, who is welcome and who is not welcome, right? We place ourselves in a seat that was made for God to sit in alone. We get the roles confused. He's like, what are you talking about? I don't want people to stop. I don't want to keep people from knowing Jesus. Maybe that's, that's not the, the deep issue of your heart at all, but sometimes we even intentionally do it based on ideas we have, opinions that we've allowed to formulate from, from, from family members, from, from other church experience, from past religion, from whatever it is. We have ideas and opinions and, and concepts in our own mind that we often cling to. And the truth is, is those can cause us to get our roles mixed up and cause us to move to the side of what God's truth and plan is, is actually for all people, right? Let me give you an example. So my wife, Rachel, is the greatest person on planet earth. You can find me about it, I promise. Um, she really is the best ever. And uh, <clears throat> so when I first saw Rachel, I was like, dang, that girl's shoo-wee. You know what I mean? <laughs> that girl's beautiful. Um, <clears throat> but I, she's way out of my league. It's a fact. Um, by the grace of God, do I stand here today? Uh, <laughs> it's, it's going too far. I need to stop. Um, so anyways, I was like, oh, she looks, I, she looks beautiful. She looks like a really nice girl. I don't know anything about her though, right? And so like over time, ask people questions about Rachel. Like, who is she, man? Like seeing her around stuff, even seeing her here at church. I was like, who is she really, you know? And I'll just tell you the truth, man. People just told me completely terrible things about Rachel. Yeah, and, oh, and exactly. I was like, wow. And it's just constant things cause of things. And hear me out. You're like, are you putting your wife's stuff out there? I'm not. They just told me things from me. I was like, is this the truth? And so I wondered, I was like, is this the truth? And the way the story goes is I realized, okay, the way I'm going to get the truth is what? I got to spend time with Rachel. I got to get to know Rachel. I don't need to just hear what other people say and they state as fact. I need to know what the facts are on myself and I need to go and see for myself. And so as I spent time with Rachel and I asked Rachel, who are you? And I got to know her. I realized that all those people were full of it, man. They were wrong and they said things, but man, were they confident? And did they say things like a matter of fact? And here's who she is. This is what I heard. This is this, 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 this. And none of them were true. But if you ask those people, they were fact. Why? Because they heard an opinion, they heard an idea and they clung to it. Don't we do this when it comes to our faith? Don't we do this with the calling that God has placed on our lives? And we say, well, this is what I think happened. Must be true. So who says it's truth? They did. You did? Because if God didn't say it's truth, then let me tell you a secret. It's probably not truth. Amen. Right? You got to go and spend time with the Lord and go, who are you, God? Who am I, God? What are your ways, God? And when we do that, we know the truth. We know the direction we're called to go. We know how we're supposed to treat people. Even if in a season, God's like, this is where you need to be. This is your people. And these people, maybe you're living a different life than you. Does that mean that God doesn't love those people? No, but God's doing something here. And we just got to trust what he's doing here. And down the road, he may go, go love those people. Trust my way. Don't, don't come up with your own uh, assumptions and ideas and opinions and make them become fact. Because that's what the Jewish people did so often with the Gentiles and others and said, you're not a part of God's plan. And God says, you have no idea what my plan looks like. We've got to trust God and say, who are you? What are your ways? Because if not, we lean into opinions and ideas that are man-made, misinterpretations. And we allow things like their history. What are their past choices? Well, they must not be who God has. They must not be the people that God wants me to, to be with, to be around their, their political stance. Oh, they're too different. They must not really love God, Right? their ideas on the way the world should work, their religious background, the, the understanding that maybe you have in a certain area that they don't have, you begin to exclude them simply because of that and push them away. They're not welcome into it. Their appearance, how they look, what they wear. Maybe they wear weird brown pants and blue commerce. <laughs> You're like, mm, I don't know, right? I don't know. And we begin to formulate our own ideas and we just hold on to them. And we, we allow it to become truth. Is that the truth, God? We forget to take that step. And we talked about this in the past, just to bring it back to, and I, I didn't really say this first service, but like, you guys remember we talked last Acts, <laughs> Acts, Acts part one, we talked about um, prescriptive versus descriptive, right? We do it with scripture, man. We take 
pieces of what God has said and we go, this is the truth. And it's like, brother, he was just telling you that the grass was green in that time. You know what I mean? It's like, what does that have to do with me? It means I've got to have my grass green at home. You should. You know what I mean? It's just like, but we take it out of context and we change things and we make it something that's not because we're human beings, human beings and we're just, we're kind of a mess. And we make things a mess. It's in our imperfect nature. So what we're, what we're actually doing is this. We're building barriers. You build barriers, I build barriers. And it keeps people, keeps us first from being able to go in directions that God has called us to because of the barriers we built. And it keeps other people from being able to come in to this place that God wants to use us because of the barriers that we've built. We build barriers. And why do we do it? Because the change, the newness, all this stuff that maybe we don't fully understand, it makes us uncomfortable. Again, it doesn't line up with what we once heard or what we've heard our entire lives. Our family members, these other people that we trusted at a certain time and place, and they were saying this. And so we thought it was 100% fact, but we never really submitted it to God. So it doesn't line up. And that makes me upset because I don't know what the truth is. And I'm confused. It's not what I think it should be. Or maybe we don't like it because we know that we're comfortable with where we are. And maybe if the truth really comes in, some, some darkness about me will be brought to light. And I don't want that. That's a hard truth, right? Or maybe it means that I'm going to have to admit that I was wrong. That there are pieces of, of what I thought the story of God was and was supposed to look like that just weren't it. And I don't want to sit there knowing I'm wrong and God's got to come in and work my pride, right? All that to say, we need a sheet of bacon. <laughs> You're like, yeah, we do. Father's Day, y'all. Come on, Father's Day's going to be great. We're literally going to have sheets of bacon. I'm just going to say that. Not like on a cloth, but there'll be bacon. Okay, just be here. It's going to be great. We need the sheet of bacon because if we don't have that moment of correction and clarity brought to us from God, like Peter had, if we don't have that love from God, if that love from God does not come down and show us the truth, the truth gets lost. People in the church get hurt. People get confused about Jesus. They get confused about authority, about their rights, and about judgment and whose it is to place. And that is not God's will for us. So let's talk about these roles to bring some clarity to this and and, and to bring some clarity to what it's supposed to be when it comes to building barriers. What are our role or what is our role? What are our roles with these barriers? And what is God's role with barriers? And how do we walk this out so we can do it in a healthy way uh, so that the good news of Jesus can continue to move forward like God has called it to? Because again, that was his plan, right? It's so funny to watch the Jewish people in these, in these passages of scripture. They had the Old Testament. They had all these prophets talking about, hey, there's gonna be a Messiah and he's gonna come and change everything and the whole world will know about, about, about him and, and will receive him and there's gonna be, and they have an opportunity to receive him, all this stuff, right? They talked about the Messiah over and over, prophecy after prophecy. God promised to come and make a way. And they're like, well, it doesn't sound like God, Right? just silliness. So we need to focus on God's role first. So if we get the roles mixed up. What are they actually supposed to look like? The first thing, God's role, first part of God's role is God builds barriers. You're like, what does that mean? Okay. And I'll say this, some of these passages we're about to walk through, they're going to feel like they have nuance, the ideas, but really there's this, this really cool thing that God does where he's like, it's not just this, it's not just this, it's this, right? It's going to be both of them. So we got to walk through it together with an open mind of what the Lord has for us. Again, submit it to him. God builds barriers. So this is Matthew 5, 17 through 19. Jesus says, don't misunderstand why I've come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. So if you ignore the least commandment, don't miss this, and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So you got this moment and Jesus comes in and there's all this mix up between him and the Pharisees and they think he's come to just wreck everything that God's done in the past, right? Jesus is like, you misunderstand. I am God's plan and I have come to complete his plan, to bring it to completion and accomplishment. Um, I am the only way that that happens. The, the, the issue that the, the human beings and the Pharisees and all these Jewish people are missing is they've tried to do the thing where they, they work to be in right standing with God and it doesn't work. They veer off, they fail, they cannot get it right. And so there's a lot of sacrifices. You don't wanna be a lamb in this time. You know what I'm saying? It's just bad. And so Jesus says, you, get, you guys couldn't get it right. You wouldn't have got it right because you are not me. You are imperfect human beings. You are not God himself. You needed me. So I came and I made it complete. I made a way, right? 
And so they miss that. They go over it now and they, they, they get confused. But we need to see, like he says in verse 19 there, is that he's not calling us to no longer receive and live through commandments and barriers that God has placed for us. God places barriers for us, folks. And they're, they're, they're out of kindness and his, his desire to see us live in a healthy way. He wants to spur us on into to becoming the people he's called us to be. And we need boundaries, right? The other day or yesterday, we were at the park with our kiddos and, and there's a fence around this park that we were at and we were playing tag and they all jumped over the fence and we're running outside. And I was like, that's a no-no, right? You gotta stay in the safe zone. You gotta stay in these spaces because this is where we are. This is where we need to be. And this is what protects us and keeps us safe and allows us to have fun with all the other, without all the other dangerous stuff going on. Does that make sense? And God, so God's got those things for us. And he goes, if you stay here, man, there's, there's good things. There's health, there's growth. There's plans that you can prosper in and all kinds of stuff that I have for you. Now, what he's not saying and what Jesus is trying to get us to understand is those are not the way to be in right standing with God. Not anymore. Jesus has made that happen, right? This is what Paul says in Romans 3, verse 21. But now God has shown us a way to be, me to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. Again, it's been, this has been the plan since the beginning. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. Again, the inclusion of the Lord in there, no matter who you are, you are made right by faith in Jesus. That's it. That's it, yep. right? Now, again, that's, Jesus is not our get out of jail free card, church. It is not go and live the crazy life. Don't have a real relationship with them. It's like, no, no, no. True salvation will bring change, amen? amen. When, we, when, we, when we accept Jesus, the Holy Spirit is given to us. He falls upon us and he begins to change us. He does a work in us and we become a new creation, the desires, the laws, the barriers that God has set, we want them. We begin to desire them and long for them because we want to be who God wants us to be. Amen. Not who the rest of the world said we should be. Not who we thought we wanted to be back then. Who God has for us. Yes. God has barriers. He builds barriers for us. And it's out of the kindness and goodness of his heart to take care of us. To get us to where we're called. To be away from death and darkness and sin and into light and eternal life with Jesus. God builds barriers and he does it for us. The second thing that God does, a part of his role with barriers is he also breaks them. Like, what? This is so weird. It sounds contradicting. It's not, I promise. God can do it all, right? A little bit like a Sour Patch Kid, sour and sweet, you know? It's just a mixture. Ephesians 2, 14, that was probably wrong of me. 14 and 15. It says, for Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from two groups. Amen. So the picture that we need to see here, kind of like Jesus says, he didn't come to abolish it, but to fulfill it is in the Old Testament, there was a way to be in right standing and there were sacrifices and a way to atone for sins and all that. And that helped people stay where they needed to be with God in an imperfect way. It wasn't fully complete because again, they veered off so much. Then Jesus comes in, in the New Testament, right? And after Jesus dies on the cross, it's no longer, here's how you do it. It is, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. That's it, right? He has made a way for me. And so what we see here is a shift in God's plan. There were barriers that looked this way and God broke them down and made them look this way, right? Do you see that? Think of it like a, a crosswalk, Check this. Crosswalks can be the most annoying place in the world. Amen. You know the button. Wait, wait, wait. You're like, I'm waiting, bro. You know what I mean? Wait. That's enough. And he just keeps going, right? There's a time to wait and there's a time to walk. There's a time to wait and understand that God is doing something here that I might not fully get or see or why know why he does it this way. And then there's a time to walk and to move forward into something else, right? He shifts the barriers. He breaks them down and he builds them a different way. Does that make sense? God has done that for us. He's made a crosswalk. He's done that for the Jewish people. There was a time for them here and there's a time for them here. Now, does this mean that God changed his mind and changed his plan? No, 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 no. This was God's plan all the way. Yep. Jesus was there in the very beginning. Right. So as he set these barriers, he didn't go, ah, it's just not working. I'm just gonna change it up, right? So, no, 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 no. He's got a plan all the way through. So the breaking of barriers does not mean we have a God who doesn't know what he's doing. It means we have, we have a God who knows exactly what he's doing Amen. better than anybody else ever could. Amen. And he's got exactly what's best for us. So he builds them and he breaks them. It was God's plan all along. 
He's the only one who can decide that, right? He's the only one who can take care of us in that way and make it so that we can be in the place we need to be with him, close, personal, in an authentic relationship, because that's what he's looking for, right? He's not, he's not looking for the religion and the tradition and all that, and, and there's good things in the midst of that. He wants you. He wants you and your heart and your trust. He wants all of you. So then what's our role? That's God's role. He builds the barriers. He breaks the barriers. What's our role? Kind of like we just said, first thing, we don't build barriers. Don't build barriers. Put your tools away. If you're anything like me, you shouldn't have them in your hands in your first place. That's just dangerous. And I got scars to prove it. Don't build barriers. God does the work, amen? Amen. God is the one who makes the things happen. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, we know this. God saved you by his grace. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that we have done, so, no, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. It's all him. Over and over and over and over again, him leading us, guiding us, taking care of us, making a way for us. It's, it's all him building the barriers, taking them down, making them look different. God has done all the work. And where it gets bad is when we start to think, look what I did, right? The Jewish people, I set myself apart, right? I've, I, look what I've done. Look what the Lord has done around me and look what I've done for me. I'm set apart. And we get lost because it's us thinking we've done the work. God has done the work. And we've got to remember that. It's, there's no other way but to remember that. His thoughts are not my thought. His ways are not my ways. Right? Only him. It's the only way it works out. So I've got to relinquish the control, relinquish the, the opinions and the ideas and what I feel like I deserve and what, whatever that may be that's keeping me from being able to walk in his path. And instead, I just got to follow his lead. And that's the second part of my role. What, what am I supposed to look like in, in this relationship with God when it comes to roles? I simply am called to follow the Father's lead. Follow him. As simple as that. You guys ever been in a mirror maze? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, mirror maze, right? So one, they are kind of scary. Two, we went to the science museum a couple months ago. And I'll tell you what, they're 100 times scarier when there's 90 kids screaming at the top of their lungs in them. It was just the worst experience of my life. But if you go through the mirror maze, it looks like there's a lot of different ways to go, right? How many ways to go is there actually? One. One way. And this is true with our relationship with God. God has set the way. He has laid the path before you and said, here's where you need to go. And is God gracious and kind if we veer off and try to go our own way? 100%. I love to say that God is the God of rerouting and he gets us back where we need to be on his path, but he has a path for us, Amen. He says, you got to just follow my leading. It's going to look like you can go that way. It's going to look like that way is going to work out. But again, I, here's my way. Those ways are your ways. See where they get you with your face smashed up against some glass, right? <laughs> follow my way. And I will lead you to what you need. Maybe not what you want, but guarantee you it's what you need. Yeah. And I will provide for you and I will love you and take care of you. So when God places his barriers, I follow. And how do I know? God will reveal them. I promise you that. There's a lot of moments where we have questions. Is this, is this this or is this that? God, am I supposed to go this way or that way? Seek him, ask him, get into his word. He's got revealed to me what the truth is. Which way am I supposed to go? And I promise you, he will reveal it to you. Amen. He will. He will show you exactly what it is you need and how you need to get there. And he will, he will have you trust him, right? That might be part of how he gets you there. It's like, go this way and trust me. Like, like Peter, right? Holy Spirit. Hey, I got some guys at the door for you. I'm like, I'm not going <laughs> Like, just trust me. I'm with you. Go. And he goes. And he sees the amazing work that God is doing. He says, I realize now that God shows no favoritism, right? You are moving, God. I can trust you. You are good. Follow God's barriers. Follow his way. So back to Peter. Uh, If you move forward to Acts chapter 11, I kind of mentioned this a few minutes ago. Um, Peter has this uh, moment when he goes back and the, the moment he gets back to the apostles, they all start criticizing him. They're like, dude, we can't believe you went and hung out with Gentiles. You ate dinner with them and you talked to them and you went to their house. Like you're unclean, right? And Peter's like, hold on. Let me tell you all about this stuff that God said to me about a, a sheet full of bacon and all this kind of stuff and making things unclean and saying they're unclean when they're not. Like he explains the whole thing to them. He's like, let me reveal to you what God has revealed 
to me. And so he walks through the whole story with them. Uh, and then after that, at, uh, towards the end, he reveals to them, uh, and, and what you see in scripture is in chapter 10 is the Holy Spirit falls upon these people. When he's with Cornelius and he's preaching to, to them and spreading the good news to them and all these Gentiles who are with Cornelius, it says the Holy Spirit falls on all who are listening. And Peter's like, okay, this is a move of God. This is 100% a move of God. And so he says that to these guys. And after they hear that, they're like, oh, okay. You know what I mean? They're like, it must be God, right? But there's this moment and and, and he's almost kind of correcting them, but he's bringing the truth to them of like, don't forget this. And this is what he says uh, at the, uh, in verse 15 of chapter 11. He says, as I began to speak, Peter continued, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as he fell on us, right? At the beginning. So remember how the Holy Spirit fell on us, guys? He fell on them. Then I thought of the Lord's words when he said, this is Jesus, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. In verse 17, and since God gave these Gentiles the same gift he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to stand in God's way? Who was I to stand in God's way? I am where I'm at simply because of God and his way alone. Amen. Right? So who was I to stand in his way and think otherwise? Who was I to cling to the opinions and the ideas that I've been taught through people and and potentially even lies of the enemy and to think that they were truth without submitting them to God? Who am I to do that? I'm I'm not, and I should not be. Just a huge, huge moment from Peter to us and to his people there. Ultimately, what Peter is encouraging them in, right, is submit this to Jesus. Submit this to God. What should we do with those feelings, those ideas that we have We feel strongly about stuff. I think this is the truth. Well, they think this is the truth. We should submit them to Jesus. When humanity gets in the way, we submit it to Jesus. Submission and surrender. Lord, here is where I am. Show me what I need. Am I in the wrong? God, does something need to change? Galatians 5, 24 and 25 says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, Let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. God, show me my blind spots. Show me my sin. Show me that which is not truth, that I have been told is truth, and that I hold on to. Tradition, religion, not that they're strictly wrong, but are they what you have for me, God? Am I walking them out the way that you called me to? Or am I like the Jewish people taking them to another level that was never your heart, never your intention? I think real quick, just if... if, uh, his name is Jesus, right? I'm called a movement because that's what I think it was, man, a move of God. Do yeah, y'all remember Easter? Come on. So we had people, anybody got a shirt on here? Let's go. Let's go. Yeah. We had a few people who had them on today in first service too. It's so cool to see these shirts around town, right? And let me tell you this. If we're being honest, there were reasons that we could have said our right reasons to not do that, right? It's like, I uh, partner with a bunch of churches who don't really have maybe everything on the same page. A few different beliefs here, different ideas here maybe would approach this situation differently than we would. We want to make sure that we're doing stuff with health. And so we can make the argument that, well, we love our church. We believe our church is healthy. So we want everybody to come to our church, right? You could do all that stuff if you wanted to. There was ideas, there was opinions, there was things we could have clung to, but God was moving. And so as a church, we decided to go, all right, Lord, here you go. Do what only you can do. And do you see the move of God that happened across our city? It's a beautiful thing, right? a beautiful thing that only he could do when, when churches come together and they say, we submit, we surrender our ideas, our opinions, our ways. God, it's, it's, it's not us, it's you. Amen. And health comes, life comes. The name of Jesus is lifted high yes. because we chose to submit and surrender and not just cling to some stuff that we, we could have made an argument that we felt like we needed to. Submit and surrender and let him be who he is. God is moving and his move is the absolute best move. Unlike any other plan, idea, authority that we could come up with, we can't let our barriers keep us from being in it. And we can't let our barriers make it harder for others to be in it because God's got stuff for them too, amen? Amen. Like God had for the Gentiles and he was gonna use his people that he set apart for the purpose of building his kingdom from the beginning. He was gonna use them to do exactly that and they had to get out of their own way to not stand in the way of God and let him move. Last thing I have, and I just want to bring clarity to this, and then we're going we're gonna to pray, but just a question for you. Was God calling Peter and the Jews to be all-inclusive to every way and idea of life? No, he was not, right? God has his barriers. He says, this is right and this is wrong, and he reveals those to us, right? And neither is he calling us to do that. 
Again, he's got stuff for us to follow. So then what is it exactly that he's calling us to? It is inclusivity of each people, of each person, right? Every single person is welcome and invited into the family of God. It does not matter who you are and it does not matter your stance or your shape or form, no matter their past, their history, their sin, their bondage, any of it. Your religious background, God says, you are welcome into my family. And the way that works is you accept my son, Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior because he's paid the way for you. You just say yes. And you let him be Lord and lead you and guide you every single day. So every person is invited into the family of God. That is the inclusivity in the heart of the Father that nobody would miss out on it. And to get there, we surrender. We let him be judge. We let him be jury. We let him be Lord over it all. We follow his barriers and his way and we trust him trust him with all of it. When we do that, we're, we're included. We're invited into the family of God and we get to let him lead. Here's how N.T. Wright, an author, puts it. He says, it is not the case then that God simply accepts us as we are. He invites us as we are. But responding to that invitation always involves the complete transformation, which is acted out in repentance, forgiveness, baptism, and receiving the spirit. Amen. He invites us as we are. And then he says, I'm gonna do a work. I'm gonna bring change because it's not that I'm okay with every idea or every way. There is one way and it's through him and what he has. He says, so let me go to work, right? Isaiah 118, come now, let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them as white as wool. The Father's heart to love us and to change us if we give him a chance and we trust him, amen? You guys wanna stand up? We're gonna pray together. Last thing I'll just say this is uh, uh, before we pray, um, I just think it's so cool, man. It's like, again, we, we have an opportunity to either help or hurt somebody's relationship with Jesus. It's real. Um, we can cause issues. We can, we can make the process of them accepting Jesus harder. We can create hurt, all kinds of stuff um, because the, the choice to follow Jesus, it's a choice given to us by our God. And it happens only in the human heart and in the individual human heart. And so we can make it harder for people for sure. But one thing we cannot do is we cannot stop the good news of Jesus Christ. No matter how hard we try. And that's an encouragement to us is we may be a mess, but our God is always bigger than our mess. We cannot stop his good news. We cannot stop the gift that he has available to all of us, right? Again, we can make it harder for people to choose. And sadly, a lot of people won't choose him. But the name of Jesus will forever be lifted high. Even in the end of days, right? Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. I look at the Roman Empire, like we talked about. These are people who started out and they were throwing Christians in the Colosseum and they were putting them on spikes and they were doing all kinds of stuff to them, eventually to tolerating Christianity. And then eventually down the road, become, Christianity becoming their central religion of their empire. That doesn't happen, but by the hand of God. So be encouraged that we have an opportunity. God's moving and we have an opportunity to jump in and join, Right? rather than stand in the way of God, like Peter talked about, to jump in and join, to trust, and to let him lead. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today. God, we thank you for, for your power, God, your authority. You know what we need, God. You know who we are. You know what we've done, and, and, and yet you invite us in. God, I pray for the barriers, Lord, the ones that we've put up and we've allowed to be set. If they're not, first place by you. God, tear them down. Take them away. Jesus, help us to just want to go your way. And if we have questions as to what it is, we're thankful. Holy Spirit, that you reveal the way. Let it be revealed to us. Lord, let us hear your voice clearly in the path we're supposed to go. Thanks for building, being the builder and the breaker. Thanks for taking care of us the way that you do. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. amen. Well, hey.